Word to Life. If you have your Bibles, we're going to be in John chapter 20 for the remainder of our message. And you know, as I thought about this message, I was confronted with one of the things that I often hear in our society when it comes to having faith in Jesus. And it's simply this, if I don't see it, I don't believe it. Have you ever heard that before? Maybe even you yourself have thought those words or felt like that. And that's, that's certainly reasonably true. I mean, for instance, for those of you who know me, if I told you I'm an excellent carpenter and I want to come build something at your house, you would probably say, well, Rick, uh, I believe in you, but I just don't trust you, okay? So it would be, yeah, that's not going to happen, <laughs> basically. You would say, Rick, why don't you show me some evidence? Why don't you give me some proof that you can actually do the job that you claim to be able to do? And a lot of people, they approach God that way. If I don't directly hear from God or see from God or if something miraculous and supernatural, if that doesn't take place, then I'm not going to believe. But here's the thing. There are so many things in life that we just accept the testimony of others. For instance, have you ever heard of this flat earth theory that is like resurrecting itself? It's the most like, it's like one of the worst things I've ever heard, okay? Because it absolutely has no evidence. It's, it's really a bad theory. And I'm sorry, if you're a flat earther, we can still be friends. I'm just, you know, a little bit better than you are. Uh, but I'm just kidding. I'm not better than you. Hey, flat earth is possible, but... None of us have seen the earth from space, have you? I mean, has anybody actually flown out to space and looked at a round earth before? No. You look at the pictures. You accept the eyewitness testimony. You've never examined the evidence yourself, but nevertheless, you accept it. How about this? Vegetables are good for you. Have you ever actually looked at the science and why vegetables are good for you? Have you ever broken it down and examined the evidence yourself? Maybe some of you have. We do have some doctors and some scientists in here. But the majority of us, we accept the testimony of people who are credible. This is the same thing whether you're dealing with human psychology or any type of science field or philosophy. Frankly, many of us don't have time to figure out whether or not donuts are good or bad for you. We just accept the testimony of other people. It's the same thing when it comes to the New Testament. We have to ask ourselves this. Even though we haven't seen the resurrection of Jesus, even though we haven't witnessed it ourselves, is their evidence trustworthy? Are they trustworthy people that we can accept the testimony that they give? We're going to talk a little bit about a guy named Thomas who had experienced something that many of you have never experienced. I certainly haven't. His life was turned upside down in the blink of an eye. I mean, his whole world was turned upside down and he was devastated. And he wanted proof that Jesus was resurrected from the dead. But Jesus said this, and we'll see this at the end of our story. Jesus said, he says to Thomas, because you have seen me, have you believed? Blessed are they who do not see yet have believed. Like I said, there are so many things that you and I, if you were just to sit down and think about in your own life, there are so many things that you accept that you have never seen yourself, that you haven't examined the evidence for yourself. You've just accepted it be, to be true because of reliable people. And that's what I want to encourage you to do this morning. I'm not asking you as a Christian, as a follower after God, to have a blind faith. And a lot of people believe that faith is a step in the darkness. It's belief in spite of evidence. And you just accept what you don't see just because that's what faith is. Well, that is, my friends, is not what faith is. That's not what the New Testament authors believed faith was. And that's not what we as a church believe faith is. We have a faith in what we don't see because of what we do see. We believe in what we don't see because of the evidence that's presented to us. And that's the same thing that's going to be offered to Thomas and the disciples, whether or not you're going to have faith. Follow along with me, starting in John chapter 20, verses 19 and, and 20. John's recording his gospel. And he says, when it was on evening of that day, so they found the empty tomb on Sunday morning, okay? So it's the first day of the week. Mary Magdalene has found an empty tomb. She's proclaimed it to the disciples. But look what happens. On that first day of the week, the doors were shut where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. And Jesus came in and stood in their midst and he said to them, peace be with you. I think it's incredible that despite the empty tomb, they are so afraid. They still have doubts. I mean, they saw what happened to Jesus. 
They saw how he was crucified, how he was beaten. They saw, uh, whether or not they saw the empty tomb uh, is one thing, but a few of the disciples had seen the empty tomb. They heard the testimony of Mary Magdalene, and yet they still had fear. Now, we don't know whether or not they were just paranoid or there was a manhunt going on for Jesus' disciples. What we do know is this. They are afraid, they doubt, and they don't know what has happened to the body of Jesus. And then all of a sudden, and this would scare me, all of a sudden, Jesus, the doors are locked and shut, and here's Jesus. He just appears in their midst, and he says, peace be with you. Now, just put yourself in their situation for a moment, all right? Your master, your Lord, your Messiah is dead, and he's been crucified, and he's been buried in a tomb with a 2,000-pound stone rolled over the front, and Sunday morning comes around, and the tomb, the tomb is empty. There's some clothes that are folded there, and nobody knows where Jesus is, and Mary Magdalene, who probably to them is not very trustworthy, claims to have seen and experienced the risen Lord. And then all of a sudden, in the midst of your doubt, Jesus appears. Now, that would be a little bit scary, But Jesus is God. If he really did resurrect from the dead, appearing suddenly is really no problem. Now, why were they afraid? I mean, isn't the empty tube enough evidence for us to believe that Jesus resurrected from the dead? Well, I don't necessarily think so. If you remember from a few weeks ago, we talked about how the disciples could have stolen the body of Jesus. They could have hallucinated that they all saw Jesus when they really didn't. I mean, there are other alternative explanations for an empty tomb. And so here Jesus is, appearing in their midst, and they have fear. And here's why they're afraid. Two reasons. The first reason is this. They had no concept of a Messiah who would die the way that he did. The Messiah to them is somebody who would come and finally give Israel control over the world. They would dominate the Romans. They would dominate the Egyptians. They would finally be put back in power, and yet their Messiah was crucified and killed like a criminal. And so their presuppositions about what was supposed to happen was absolutely destroyed. Everything they believed to be true was brought down by the crucifixion of Jesus. Here's the second reason why they're afraid. is because there was no such thing to them as a resurrection until the general resurrection at the end of the world. And so the idea that Jesus could come back from the dead was doctrinally untrue to them. And so all they know to do is shrink back and be afraid. Everything they thought to be true was untrue. Their world was shattered. Their master was dead and he was gone. Now I think this is interesting The first thing that he says is peace. He speaks a word of peace, obviously, because they're afraid. But look at what verse 20 says. When he had said this, look at what he does. He showed them his hands and his side. And the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. And so Jesus said to them, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. And he said, if you forgive the sins of any, their sins will be forgiven. And if you retain the sins of any, they have been retained. Here's what I love about Jesus, and this is why I'm a Christian. It's because Jesus doesn't just rely on some mystical experience. He doesn't want them to go off some feeling whether or not Jesus was resurrected from the dead. He offers them evidential proof that he has resurrected from the dead. He says, you don't believe that I'm alive? Look at my hands. Look at my side where I was pierced through with a spear. This is what your testimony is going to be based on. When you carry out the mission that I'm going to send you on to the whole world, I don't want you to go off an emotional feeling. I want to send you out with eyewitness testimony, with objective evidence that I am resurrected from the dead. And that same evidence is presented to you and I. Has anybody seen the risen Lord here this morning? No. But what we must go on is the eyewitness testimony of those who claim to have seen it. Now remember, their Jewish leader is dead. They have every reason not to believe in a resurrected Lord. They could have went on about their life. They could have retained their marriages. They could have sustained their families. They could have gone on and been the greatest Jews that you could ever imagine. Go back to fishing. But something happened to these guys that changed their world forever. They were willing to die for what they believed to be the truth. 
Now, people don't die for what they know to be a lie. I mean, for instance, if they all just stole the body of Jesus, who is going to allow themselves to be beheaded or dragged through the streets with a rope around their neck or run through with a spear or crucified upside down? No one is going to die like that for what they know to be a lie. And if they stole the body of Jesus, they would have known what they were saying was a lie. Yet in the midst of their persecution, they refused to revoke their belief in Jesus. What happened to these guys that caused them to believe something where they were in a position to know whether or not it was true? Well, I think the best explanation is Jesus resurrected from the dead. And he showed them his hands and his side. And he sent them out on a mission because they experienced the risen Lord. Well, how about this? They're overjoyed because they all had a hallucination. And I shared this a few Sundays ago during Sunday school um, when we talked about the resurrection of Jesus. Here's the simple reality. Group hallucinations don't happen. Let me read to you something by a guy named Gary Sibsey. He's a clinical psychologist. He has a doctor's degree in his field. He has mastered the subject. He is a professional in the subject of hallucinations. This is what he had to say. He said, I have surveyed the professional literature, which are peer-reviewed journals and articles, all right, actual scientists, not like Instagram bloggers and things like that. And he said, "I I have surveyed the professional literature written by psychologists and psychiatrists and other relevant healthcare professionals during the past two decades, and I have yet to find a single documented case of group hallucination. That is an event for which more than one person perfectly shared in a visual or other sensory perception where there was no clearly external referent. In other words, these people who claimed to experience the same thing had an external referent. There was no group hallucination that happened. So we can certainly rule out the theory that the disciples stole the body of Jesus. They were in a position to know whether or not it was true, and yet they proclaimed the Lord's death even into their own crucifixions, beheadings, and terrible sufferings. There's no evidence for group hallucinations. It's just not there. And so what's the best explanation? Well, as I said earlier, Jesus really did resurrect from the dead. He was alive. And so he sends them out on this ministry of eyewitness testimony. And that's what apostolic Christianity is all about. That's what the church was founded upon. They didn't say, let me share to you some folklore literature that I inherited and I received from so-and-so. For instance, in 2 Peter 1, verse 16, Peter says, "We, we aren't sharing with you folklore. We aren't sharing with you wives' tales. We aren't sharing with you things that we just inherited from one person to another. He says, we are giving you eyewitness testimony. John has this to say in 1 John 1, verses 1 through 2. He says, we are proclaiming to you that which we've seen that which we felt with our hands. We've touched Jesus. We've heard Jesus with our ears. We've seen Jesus with with our eyes. This word of life that was manifested unto us, we are now proclaiming to you. We're giving you the very things that we saw and felt and experienced. Now, you know what's the strongest piece of evidence that hands up in a court of law? Eyewitness testimony. That's what early Christianity was founded upon. Not belief in spite of evidence, belief because of evidence. Let me share with you why eyewitness testimony was so important. We got a guy named Luke who wrote the Gospel of Luke. He was a doctor. He was a Greek doctor. He went on to write the book of Acts as well. He never saw Jesus' ministry. He never experienced the risen Lord, but yet he became a believer. Why? Because of the evidence. He saw the evidence for himself. So when he went on to write the Gospel of Luke in the book of Acts, He undertook a great amount of work, and he actually interviewed eyewitness testimony about Jesus' life, death, burial, and resurrection. And he compiled it into two books that we call the New Testament, the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts. And so look at what he has to say at the beginning of his gospel. This is how important eyewitness testimony was to the early church. He says in Luke chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, Many have undertaken to compose an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us. He's talking about Matthew, Mark, another source that they call Q, which we don't have access today. He's talking about Paul. Many people have gone through this ordeal to write the things that they've experienced. And look at what he says. He says, just as they were handed down to us by the initial eyewitnesses and servants of the word. And so Luke says, look, I want to get one thing clear. 
when it comes to Jesus' resurrection and what I'm about to write about, it wasn't based on mystical, emotional experience. It was based on factual eyewitness testimony of people who experienced the risen Lord themselves. He might have interviewed Jesus' mother, who raised Jesus and put him up, you know, saw him get crucified and buried in the tomb. Who knows? We don't know, but we do know he investigated eyewitness testimony. And so here is Jesus appeared to them in the midst of this room. And it says, it says, so as I, the father has sent me, I am sending you. The first thing they're sent out with is eyewitness testimony. The second thing that they're sent out with is the authority of Jesus. He says, look, just like the father has sent me, so I'm going to send you into the world. In other words, I am going to give you the authority that I myself have received from my Father. Have you ever talked with anybody who says, look, I'll read the red letters, just not the black ones? Have you ever heard anybody? Maybe you thought that yourself. I'll just stick with the words of Jesus, not all the other stuff. How did you get the red letters? (laughs) You got the red letters from eyewitness testimony. So the red letters are really black letters, right? Because Jesus never wrote anything himself. He relied on the testimony of other people. So the entire Bible is the word of God. The entire Bible is the word of God that he has given us through his apostles. And he says, look, I'm going to send you to carry out my mission. I died on the cross for the forgiveness of their sins. And I want you to share this with the entire world. And so he gives them this great authority. And there is no significant difference between the authority that Jesus received from the Father and the authority that he gave to his apostles in sending them out into the world. They're sent out with eyewitness testimony. And they're sent out with the authority of God himself. Now, this is kind of weird. It says that he breathed on them the Holy Spirit. Is the Holy Spirit a mixture of oxygen and carbon dioxide? All right, that's kind of weird. No, okay. This is a foreshadowing of what was to come. This was his way and John's way of writing. Jesus gave them his authority. We know that the Holy Spirit didn't come upon them until 50 days after Jesus' resurrection. We call it the day of Pentecost. That's in Acts chapter 1, verses 6 through 8. Jesus told his disciples, wait in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit comes to give you power. We know in John 16, verse 7, that Jesus said, I will not send you the Holy Spirit until I am gone from you. And Jesus was still there in his resurrected form. So we know that this is simply a foreshadowing of what was to come. I'm giving you my authority. You now have the responsibility. And that's the third thing that Jesus sends them out with. Look at what he says. He says in John chapter 20, he says, if you forgive the sins of any, they will be forgiven. And if you retain the sins of any, they will be retained. Now, kind of at first, you're like, wow, a little bit too much, (laughs) right? I mean, come on. Is this really some papal power that they're going to be able to have the ability to, you know, absolve the sins of some? And if they just don't like anybody or if they haven't given enough money or, you know, whatever, they haven't had enough children, we're going to hold your sins against you. Is that really what Jesus is saying? No. Here's what he's saying. When you go share the message, the gospel, and you preach the truth, and you share the testimony that I have given you, and you proclaim the possibility of the forgiveness of sins, if people obey the gospel, I promise I will forgive their sins. That's what God's saying. That's what Jesus is telling them. Disciples, when you go preach the word based on eyewitness testimony and my authority, and you make the promise, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved, I promise I'll forgive their sins. And here's another promise. If they don't accept the gospel message, their sins will be retained. Let me show you what I'm talking about. In Mark chapter 16, this is Mark's version of the Great Commission. Mark is quoting Jesus, and Jesus is there with his disciples, and he says this, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. He who doesn't believe will be condemned. That's the simple gospel message. Go into the world, preach the gospel that I've entrusted to you. If they obey, I promise I'll save them. If they don't obey, they will be condemned. Their sins will be retained against them. And so they have great responsibility to share the truthful message of Jesus. They've been sent out with eyewitness testimony, with awesome authority, and with great responsibility. Jesus is alive. He's resurrected from the dead. And this is good news. Look, if I don't have evidence for the resurrection of Jesus, I'm not wasting my time. I wasn't always a preacher. I could have gone and done a lot of other things. I don't have to be up here on this stage. And I'm certainly not going to preach and teach something that I don't believe to be true. I was talking with a young man a couple months ago. 
And he was just astounded that I'm a Christian because of evidence. Couldn't believe it. Couldn't believe that faith really was something that you believed because of evidential reasons, not just a blind step in the darkness. And that's my encouragement to you. When you leave here today, I want you to be encouraged that your saving faith is based on evidence, not some random idea or some mystical feeling or something that you can't correspond to historical truth. That's what it means to be a Christian. I believe, and it's trustworthy. And so they have authority, they have responsibility, but there's one person that wasn't there. It's who I talked about in the beginning. His name is Thomas. Look at what John says in John chapter 20, verse 24. But Thomas, one of the 12, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples were saying to him, we have seen the Lord. But look at what he says. Unless I see his hands and the imprint of his nails and put my finger into the place of his nails and my hand into his side, I will not believe. Now Thomas is one of the 12 disciples. He had witnessed Jesus' miracle ministry. I mean, he literally saw Lazarus be raised from the dead. And Thomas, at this time, in John chapter 11, he says, let us go that we may die with Jesus. (laughs) He was willing to die for his Messiah. That's how loyal of a person he was. I mean, I don't know about you, but man, if death was knocking on my front door, if somebody wanted to kill me for Jesus' name, that would be a really difficult thing to work through, would it not? I mean, that's where you really know, do I believe this stuff or not? And here is Thomas in John chapter 11, willing to die. That's how powerful his belief was with Jesus. And yet in John chapter 20, he says, look, my world has been turned upside down. This Messiah that I thought was going to reign in the world was going to turn everything over to us Jews and we were going to have power and authority and, you know, maybe a gold crown or two, you know, something cool like that. But everything was going to be great. And then he dies. And he doesn't just die, he dies horribly through the crucifixion and through the beatings. He says, I've been so traumatized that I am not going to believe unless I see it and experience it myself. The disciples, we have seen the Lord. He says, I don't really care. (laughs) Have you ever shared the gospel message with someone? You're like, hey, you want to come to church? You're like, no. (laughs) Why? The church is the last place that I would want to go. And you're like, oh, oh, okay. I'm never inviting anybody to church again. (laughs) I mean, when you get rejected trying to share the gospel, that is not an easy thing to go through. And the disciples know exactly what you're talking about. I mean, here they are, the original 12. They're ministering to, the, to their brother Thomas, and he says, look, I, I don't want any part of this. I saw what happened to Jesus. You can't fool or trick me. And so Thomas gets this, this name, Doubting Thomas. So they share this personal testimony. Look at what God has done to me. And he says, hey, look, unless I see his hands in the imprint of the nails and put my finger into, into where, the, where the nails were and I put my hand into his side, I will not believe. You know, I think we can understand Thomas's hurt. I mean, a lot of us have this idea that becoming a Christian makes everything healthy and wealthy and wise and our world gets wrecked with natural or moral evil and everything gets turned upside down and we look up at God we say really God is this is this what you wanted is this really what you had in mind for me is this what your scripture promises that here I am trying to follow you like I've never followed you before and life just seems to be harder than it's ever been has that ever happened to you here's why biblical evidential faith is so important is because it carries you through the moral and intellectual weaknesses that we all have Everybody doubts at one point in time. Everybody has questions. Everybody experiences pain and suffering. And we all hit those points in our life where we're like, is this really true? And that's when we turn back to the evidence. And evidential faith is essential to Christianity. You're going to have challenges in your own walk and in your own life. You're going to have things that are going to happen to you that are really difficult to work through. And it's when you turn back to the evidence that gives you the assurance of your faith. And so here is Thomas. His world is turned upside down. And look at what John goes on to say in verse 26. After eight days, his disciples were again inside. So eight days have transpired since the other disciples have saw the risen Lord. Thomas still isn't convinced. Many of us have worked with people for eight years and they've never accepted our invitation to church. They don't want to hear the evidence of Christianity. And look at what happens. It says, after eight days, they were again inside and Thomas was with them. And look look at what Jesus does. Jesus came, the doors having been shut, stood in their midst and said, peace be with you. 
Jesus is on a mission. He turns to Thomas and he says, Thomas, reach here with your finger and see my hands. Reach here with your hand and put it into my side and do not be unbelieving, but believing. He's challenging Thomas. What's stopping you, Thomas? Go ahead. If you really want to touch my hands and feel my side and believe that I've resurrected from the dead, do it. I dare you. And often God will challenge us as well. Look, if you've got an intellectual hurdle to the truthfulness of Christianity, God just challenged you this morning. Go look at the evidence. Now, we have so much more than what the disciples had. We've got a lot of really good evidence they didn't have access to. No wonder Jesus needed to be resurrected from the dead in order to persuade their unbelief. I mean, we've got science on our side. You look at things like the cosmological argument. Everything that begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist, therefore the universe has a cause. That cause has to be timeless, spaceless, and immaterial, and incredibly powerful in order to cause the entire material universe to come into existence. Science backs that claim up. We have this evidence. We get the teleological argument. Do you know how many initial conditions had to be put in place at the beginning of the universe in order for our material universe as we know it to come to, come to be? I mean, it is mathematically impossible. It is one of the most powerful arguments that we have access to today, the teleological argument. How about the moral argument? Have you ever looked at something in the world and you're like, that isn't right, that's evil, that's wrong? C.S. Lewis put it like this, I couldn't call a crooked line crooked unless I knew what a straight line was. And that's why the moral argument is so powerful. We know things are wrong, why? Because deep down inside we know what is right. We all have a moral law written upon our heart. We know what is right and we choose to disobey it. And then we've got the evidence of the resurrection. I mean, we have all of this information and God is challenging Thomas and he's challenging you and I. If you don't believe, I dare you to look at the evidence presented before you. And that's what I wanna encourage you to do. If you're struggling in your faith, look at the evidence that God gives to you in his word and look at the evidence that God gives to you in philosophy and in science. And I think you'll be persuaded that your faith is a rational faith. And so here's the question. He says, feel my side if you want to. Touch my fingers, touch my hands. He's given eyewitness testimony. And Jesus says, look, stop disbelieving and start believing. It's a command, literally, Thomas, do not be unfaithful to me, but be faithful. Look at the evidence that I've given you. And look at what verse 28 says. Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. Didn't even need to touch Jesus' hands. Didn't need to touch his side. In the midst of the evidence provided, I could imagine Thomas falling down on his knees and looking up Jesus and saying, my Lord and my God. He came to rational faith. Here's what faith is. Faith is two things. It's assent, mental assent. You believe in certain facts about Jesus and it's trust. You believe in the person of Jesus. So you believe in someone and you believe that someone can do certain things. You believe in someone and you believe that someone can do certain things. Look, it's one thing to, to say, Rick, I believe in you that you're a good carpenter. It's a whole other thing to hire me to do work at your house. <laughs> it's one thing to say, look, I believe in Jesus. It's a whole other thing to trust him and put your time and your money and your, your study into his hands. You see, we can look at the Bible and say, yeah, I believe that Jesus, you know, resurrected from the dead and he was who he claimed to be. But if we're not willing to get up and follow Jesus, we're not trusting him. How do we know that Thomas had saving faith? When he saw the evidence, his saving faith expressed itself in confession, my Lord and my God. And you and I, if we really have true saving faith, it will express itself in obedience to God. We will believe in a person. Jesus is who he claimed to be. And we will believe that God raised Jesus from the dead. Those are the two essential aspects of true saving faith. And so that's my encouragement to you this morning. If you want to have the saving faith of Thomas, believe in the person of Jesus and that God raised Jesus from the dead. And if you have saving faith, it will work itself out in the expression of saving faith. Confession, repentance, baptism. You know, on the day of Pentecost, these people who had crucified Jesus, they, uh, they were indicted by Peter. He preached a dynamic sermon in Acts chapter 2, and he says, look, I've got some good news and I've got some bad news. 
the Jesus that was crucified, he's actually Lord, he's Christ. You crucified the Lord of glory. And it says in verse 36 that they were pierced to the heart. Verses 36 and 37, it says they were convicted. And they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? The emphasis, what shall we do in order to be saved? And Peter said, if you really have saving faith, you'll repent and you'll be baptized. Every one of you. In the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. True saving biblical faith expresses itself in obedience. And so how do we know, for instance, that Thomas had saving faith? He confessed. If we talk about Father Abraham, how do we know that Abraham had saving faith? He was willing to offer his son Isaac on the altar. He was willing to leave his homeland and follow wherever God laid out for him to go. How do we know we have saving faith? Well, let's take a hard look at our life, at our action, and what we do. Are we really living the life that Jesus died for on the cross? So here is Thomas as we wrap all of this up. He looks to Jesus. He says, my Lord, which could be a term for sir, but in this context, it was, it was a description of deity. He says, you are my Lord. And look what also he says, my God. It's pretty clear what Thomas meant by that. You're the God of the Old Testament. You were the person you claimed to be all along. I was wrong, Jesus. You were right. And this confession came without actually having to touch Jesus' wounds. And that's the same thing that God wants for us. Thomas should have believed in the eyewitness testimony. But he didn't. And Jesus says this in verse 29. He says, Thomas, you've believed because you've seen. Blessed are those who believe and yet have not seen. Who's he talking about? He's talking about us. He's talking about you. He's talking about me. Blessed are those who believe without having seen. And my encouragement to you is to look at the evidence. Be rational about the truth of the gospel. Look at science and philosophy and history and see whether or not Christianity stands the test of a reasonable faith. And I think you'll come away assured, convicted, and empowered by what God has done and will continue to do through your life. But regardless of all of those things, the most important thing that you can look into is this book right here, the Word of God. If you want a biblical saving faith, the Bible says in Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing the Word of God. And so if you want the life that Jesus died for on the cross, pick up your Bible and start reading it. Start with the Gospels. Read through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Look into who this person was that claimed to be the very one to die for you. Look at what he.